Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Fox Fuller. Thanks for joining us for today's No Neuropsychology Didactic Series panel. As you all know, as many of you know by now, the No Neuropsychology Didactic Series um, features different 12 week didactic series volumes, um, which covers a variety of different topics in the field, including clinical disorders, professional development, practice issues, and research. The No Neuropsychology Didactic Series was founded by a team of career, early career and trainee uh, professionals who were interested in advancing free open source didactic opportunities about neuropsychology. We'd like to continue to thank our generous financial sponsors for their support of our initiative. And a few disclaimers before we begin um, today's panel. So the No Neuropsychology Didactic Series is not intended to replace formal training in neuropsychology and the views of the speakers are entirely their own. So today we will be having a panel discussion. So I encourage all of you to be very active and use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to submit questions um, to the panelists. We'll be having a Q&A period at the end of the panel today, but I'll also try to weave in your questions throughout the discussion. So please uh, feel free to be an active participant in our discussion today. So without further ado, it's my pleasure uh, today to welcome Dr. Laura Boxley and Dr. Pamela Dean to the No Neuropsychology Lecture Series. Dr. Boxley and Dr. Dean will be presenting as panelists in work this panel called Work-Life Integration and in Neuropsychology. So let me give you a brief introduction for Dr. Dean and then Dr. Boxley. Dr. Dean is a board-certified clinical neuropsychologist at the Puget Sound VA Hospital and an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. Her primary clinical interests include the evaluation and treatment of neurodegenerative disorders. Her research interests include both neurologic and rehabilitation populations, respectively, including disparities in neuropsychological assessment with underrepresented populations, as well as neurocognitive and neuroanatomical correlates of neurodegenerative disorders. Dr. Dean also serves on several national neuropsychology organizations in roles that focus on education, training, mentorship, supervision, and professional advocacy. And these include the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology's Educational Advisory Committee and Program Committee, the American Academy for Clinical Neuropsychology Publications and Student Advisory Committees, and the International Neuropsychological Society's Newsletter and Education Committees. Additionally, Dr. Dean is a practice sample reviewer for the American Board of Clinical Neuropsychology, APSEN, and she serves on BRAIN, which stands for Be Ready for ABIP in Neuropsychology Leadership Team. That's a lovely acronym. Um, Dr. Dean's also working on several projects right now relating to work-life integration. So our other panelist today is Dr. Laura Boxley, and Dr. Boxley is a board-certified clinical neuropsychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health with a joint appointment in neurology at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Boxley additionally serves as Director of Clinical Neuropsychology Training, providing education and training in clinical psychology, psychiatry, neurology, and um, training for the interns and residents. Her clinical and scholarly interests include the cognitive and psychiatric correlates of medical illness, including cancer, traumatic brain injury, and neurodegenerative disease. Dr. Boxley also serves the field of neuropsychology at the national level, including being the chair of the Publications and Communications Committee for SCN. And like Dr. Dean, Dr. Boxley is actively working on several projects in the area of work-life integration. Before we begin, I actually want to um, show this article that was recently published in the APA Monitor um, featuring an interview with Dr. Boxley, which I highly encourage you to look at. So this will, um, I think, help frame some of the conversation today. And just, I wanted to give a brief overview for what we're going to do. Of course, we're welcome to go down um, some rabbit holes or you know some good discussions as well on the side, but we'll start off with having Dr. Dean and Dr. Boxley describe what work-life integration is defined as and what its benefits are. Then they'll discuss problems seen in workplaces that do not have a good work-life integration. And we'll talk about ways to advocate and make change in our institutions and places of work, especially across the different levels of training and professional development. And then at the end, we'll, um, time permitting, we'll have open questions and answers. Like I said, please be an active participant today if you're joining us um, by sending questions to the Q&A box. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and we'll start off, um, Dr. Dean and Bo Dr. Boxley, with that work-life integration definition and what you perceive its benefits are and any other comments on that. Oh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Boxley, you're on mute, I think. There we go. Um, I'm happy to start us off. Um, 
So I think a lot of us are used to thinking about um, work-life balance. So um, when you have work-life balance, a person would theoretically equally prioritize the demands of their career and their life outside of it. And if not equal, the boundaries between one's work and their life is relatively firm. In some ways, they might be in opposition or competition, and you could think of them as being in zero sum, or if one side gains, another side necessarily loses. In contrast, work-life integration involves blending both personal and professional responsibilities. So rather than viewing work and personal time as discrete or separate entities, areas of fluctuation and perhaps synergy can be found. So the largest advantage of work-life integration is flexibility. Um, when employees are able to optimally coordinate their schedules and responsibilities, they're more likely to experience satisfaction in all areas of their life. On the flip side, boundary violations can also have negative consequences. For example, someone could easily find themselves in a situation where their work creeps into their personal lives in a way that keeps them constantly working rather than flexibly working. Um, then they might be dissatisfied with both their work and personal lives. Um, I think the discussion about work-life balance and work-life integration is ultimately about choice. I think that in order to have a diverse workforce, um, we need to think about ways to accommodate multiple work strategies and realize that one particular strategy might fit the season of life that you're in, uh, but might change over time as life demands change. So for example, um, I have small children. Um, so stark boundaries between my personal and professional life would probably prevent me from having my current career in academic medicine. Um, my current season of life is having a two-year-old with his second round of hand, foot, and mouth disease today and having to find alternative options since he's very contagious. Um, that's my season of life. I could also see myself down the road really appreciating stronger boundaries between my home life and work life. I think the lives that we're all leading though these days is really moving in favor of the popularity of this work-life integration idea. I don't know if that's kind of your experience, Dr. Dean. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I think makes it really challenging is when you look at the literature, there's really not a great definition and it's really open to interpretation. It's very ambiguous and it makes it really hard for us to understand what does this actually mean in our own personal lives? And Dr. Foxley, as you were saying, it's really this, the, the, the term work-life balance in itself kind of assumes that there's these two dichotomous stagnant constructs, but like you were saying, in reality, they're flexing and they're moving based on our personal and professional lives. Um, what is salient, what our priorities are, what is the demand of the current environment that we're in, in terms of our institution, if we're in graduate school versus early training versus your career. And then other external factors like having a family. I also have a family. I have three kids, everything from high school, teenager, which is really super fun right now, um, down to a five-year-old who's still in preschool. And with COVID, this has opened up a whole new thing for us to figure out how we balance our personal and professional roles because now, you know, the a child having something as simple as a runny nose now is you have to get the COVID test and you have to keep them out if they've been exposed and it completely changes how we function and our professional roles. And that's for somebody who's been in, you know, I've been in my career now, I'm considered mid-career. Um, what is this like for somebody who's in graduate school who might not be able to take that time uh, away from their education and their studies and things like that. So the fact that we don't have a, a super clear understanding in terms of how we define work-life integration or work-life balance is, is part of the problem and how we implement it. Well, and I, I think that um, we need to be careful about work-life integration as a discussion because it's not just about families, it's about um, diverse households that are multi-generational, it's about individuals with chronic illness, it's about people who just want a different have different expectations of their life or needs. And so we need to expand the way we're talking about it and especially move it away from a very gendered conversation to more inclusive conversation. So while it is the case that, um, you know, developing one's family is kind of a stage of life thing that people are requesting from early career into mid career might be more preoccupied with, we really need to expand the way that we're conceptualizing um, work life integration and be more inclusive about it and talk about it from the perspective of early career, mid career, and late career. Because I can definitely anticipate, and I have colleagues who are later in career, but they have needs that also require flexibility. And so opening it up creates kind of more opportunities for um, kind of community appreciation of this concept that I think gives us an opportunity to um, recognize the humanness in each other and making sure that we're taking care of ourselves as that kind of uh, 
as self-care, which is something I'm passionate about, is central to our ethics code. It's something that we need to pay attention to and that has been undervalued to this point, in my opinion. 100%. And I think so much of this also is dependent on what our aspirations are, where we are, if we're in graduate school or training or career, those aspirations are going to change and maybe again flex with where we're putting our priorities, um, what our self expectations are and what the expe external expectations are, the expectations of our career placement or educational training placements what our own priorities are in our current life and, and uh, things like self-esteem or other external factors like you were saying that play a role in this in terms of um, individual versus more collectivistic cultures um, and how that plays into somebody's appreciation and understanding and how they define work-life integration or wellness or well-being. Um, what are the geographical limitations or the not limitations but the geographical factors that might play into it or access to various resources what are the institutional parameters um, leadership all of these different things that kind of play into our ability to define what this means for us and how does that shift over time in one's career yeah i think it could be helpful when you're trying to operationalize this concept to think about it so ashford and clark um, I'll kind of touch on this idea of flexibility and permeability. So the flexibility is your ability to um, kind of dip in and out of work and life, but the permeability is how work or life kind of imposes itself on you. And so finding that optimum balance of having good flexibility, being able to shift um, without that permeability kind of imposing and transgressing, where do we find those balances? You know, if I'm trying to find flexibility and being kind of working at alternate times, but then my work is intruding in ways I don't have control over. That element of control and choice is what um, strongly influences well-being, kind of perceived well-being both at work and at home. So um, I know that um, there's some work out there, there's a paper I did with um, Dr. Block and Dr. Fagan that kind of talks about kind of the, the specifics of that dynamic and how it's applied. But I agree with you, you said before, the literature, especially within psychology and in medicine is pretty thin. And so we had to borrow from business and kind of look more afield for things that would talk about this dynamic. But I think, um, you know, the, the work-life integration question was something that, um, until the tech bros got really excited about it, it was very gendered. It was something that was like, you know, it was seen as a substandard way of, of business rather than some, a, a way of business, you know? And so now, especially post COVID, we're seeing kind of more buy-in in this idea that uh, working flexibly is not inferior to other ways of working. In fact, it is the way that many businesses are recruiting now, which is, amazing and, and I think it's a good thing for everybody but it makes me think of those generations of women who've asked for that all along and were treated as unserious or people who have disabilities and told that they weren't able to work because they couldn't fit that one model and that one model was a preference it was not a core feature and I think that's the important thing that COVID has helped um, convey to a lot of people is that um, we can really think about our expectations and what we inherited from generations prior um, who maybe had a more conventional um, cisgendered kind of male led single working family into something that looks really different in a modern context. If we want to be inclusive, we have to really challenge those expectations of what work looks like. Um, and I think we're just at the beginnings of that. You know, it's really interesting that you say that how COVID really kind of pushed us forward. And it, it's so incredibly true that the, we've been working on two papers with members from the Education Advisory Committee on uh, wellness and burnout as they, um, as they relate specifically to neuropsychology. And this paper really seemed to kind of get more momentum as we were in the crux of the pandemic, as this, we were thrust into having to think differently not only about how we conduct our careers, but how we do education, how we do training, how we do supervision, um, how do we take care of our family? If you're a care, if you're a caregiver for either a child or a family member, how are you doing this in balancing work while in your home uh, potentially, and then creating those boundaries for being able to you know walk away? I work in the VA, and prior to this, I didn't have access to work at home. And it was a great natural boundary that when I left work, I left work. And if I had to come in, you know, on extra 
hours to get something done, you know, so be it. Now, everything I have access everywhere, I can work from home, I can work from the office, and it really blurs those boundaries uh, that were previously in place before and, um, and how you set that and how you, again, how you define it, which can shift over time. And so we've really, the, the pandemic has really helped us to think about things. I think as neuropsychologists, we really don't like change and we get stuck in our ways. And this has really given us a great new opportunity to shake things up and really evaluate our education and training programs and how we do uh, patient care and, and our careers. Yeah, I would, I would strongly agree. I mean, a lot of our favorite measures um, were World War II era measures that we continue to use. So we definitely have some aspects of ourselves that we really stick to some tried and true stuff. Um, and I think COVID, one thing that we need to be really attuned to, I think, is that COVID did not affect everybody equally. Um, the type of job you had, the setting you had, whether you were a first responder, whether you were stacking um, you know, groceries at the grocery store, your exposure, all of your, the country that you lived in played a tremendous role in how COVID affected you over the past 18 months. So I think um, we are used to self-care as this thing that we don't teach academically largely. Um, we don't, um, we're not taught how to do it. We kind of send people down the, the aisles of Barnes and Noble to go figure it out on the self-help line, right? We don't talk about it rigorously or academically, um, but yet it is centered to our ethics code. We need to treat right. it with the respect that it deserves rather than being kind of a soft thing that like other people know that's something that has to be integral to our professional practice. Um, and to be really thinking about, uh, you know, even though you personally might not have had a momentous COVID experience, that is not everybody's experience. And so, um, you know, we, th we think about self-care as being bottom up, meaning what do I eat? Do I sleep well? I mean, some kind of, so I was um, chair of uh, ACA at APA for several years and we did this survey. So it's colleague assistance. And we did a survey of self-care um, across, you know, membership broadly. Um, and what we learned was, is that people had a pretty cursory understanding of what self-care was. They did kind of the basics, very health focused. It was underdeveloped. Um, and I think that people were saying that they were kind of getting it from their friends and kind of winging it. They didn't really have a systematic way to approach it or understand it. Um, and I think that's to our great detriment. You know, we are, um, kind of specially trained to be good at this and we are somehow not good at this, you know? Um, and so really looking at ourselves and, and thinking about, um, you know, what are those top down pressures that come down to? So we, we can't, when we only look at it from bottom up, what is, are you exercising enough? Like I seriously, we get a flyer for doing desk yoga. There's nothing more depressing, depressing in life than desk yoga or like, how about another lap around the parking lot? Are you kidding me? I mean, I think it's become a little bit of like an HR joke because people don't sense that we're not approaching it with the seriousness that it deserves. You need to have some level of kind of bottom up um, control over or interest in self care and efficacy and all that, but you have to have a matching top down because when you make it only about the bottom up, we end up placing um, a lot of suffering and blame on the individual for levels of the system they don't have access to and it's not appropriate to. And so that's what I think our next kind of step in self care um, and kind of work quality and all of that is understanding that we've been letting the top down folks off the hook for a really long time. And we need to have both, not, it's not just one or the other, it is both. Um, but our current systems of work kind of reinforce that folks who are in control kind of dictate how things go. And as we, as individuals, rise in our careers and have um, privilege and influence, we need to start leveraging our privilege and influence in whatever kind of in our, in our building, in our section, in our institutions, in our states, whatever you can touch as a, as a, practitioner, as a professional, as an academic, that's the place where you can start to make this difference because um, faster than you know, it doesn't feel like it in graduate school, but faster than you will believe, you will be in positions where you manage other people or where you have some degree of control over the, the culture or the content of what's happening um, in your sphere. And that's where things really get exciting. And that's where you have the opportunity to make things change. You know, I think one of the issues that we have is that there's just not a great, there's not a great model in our discipline. And I think you touched on this before. So far, the, the majority of the research that's out there is related to medical schools and business programs. 
And, you know, we, we say a lot, but we don't necessarily practice what we are promoting. And so, for example, the APA standards of accreditation, they don't outline recommendations for supporting things like wellness in graduate school, but things like the ACGME, which governs the medical schools, they have included things like finding meaning in work and protecting time with your patients and minis- um, minimizing administrative obligations that are outside clinical care, having support. They actually like outline these things, um, including things like attention to aspects of uh, professional relationships and work characteristics and making sure that there's time for personal care needs, even during work hours to have those things attended to. And so more of that kind of top-down approach. The other issue is, um, when, as we were preparing for these two papers, I was doing a, a search through our major organizations. And again, while these are kind of cursory, uh, emphasized uh, concepts within our major organizations, you can't find anything very easily or at all, I, I kind of venture to say, um, that's being promoted. And so we're looking at this in, in terms of an organizational uh, leadership issue in terms of neuropsychology as a, as a whole. Uh, so we can promote this, but we're not actually getting any guidance from, you know, how do we in, how do we influence this in terms of the legislation? How do we change our work culture? How do we change the expectations within education and training? Um, and all of these different things that that impact our ability to actually carry out uh, aspects of wellness in order to help support our well-being and then promote this work-life integration satisfaction model. Um, there was something else I was going to say, and I totally forgot what it was. Um, oh, just kind of as a, a really silly example of this, uh, I was walking in, you know, I, I know I need to get my flu shot. It's on my to-do list. It's one of those things that just, just keeps moving down because while well, it's a priority, there's other things that are kind of taking precedence over it. And something so silly as my work set this up uh, right when you enter. They had, they were capturing folks and like, hey, do you need your flu shot? Here, let's take you in right now and get it. So it was like, oh goodness, this is one thing I can just check off my list. It's done, it's easy. And you know, that was a shift within our environment and how uh, the organizational leadership decided to handle something so simple that contributes to your overall health. Uh, and then, you know, reducing the extra stress or time demands that it takes away from you having to then go schedule that or program that in. They just took that right off the hands and said, hey, you, wait, you walked in. And grab it. Great, great. I think it's a great example of a lot of these things that are going to make a big difference in people's ability to be successful don't have to be like reinventing the wheel. They're really kind of, there's a lot of fundamental aspects of public health that apply well. Um, and things where we have, we have opportunities in small ways and big ways and kind of not stopping to be satisfied with just one or the other, but really kind of doing both and do something as um, as well as some of the people that we, we employ, that we work with, um, might have more kind of, uh, I would say, strict boundaries around their time obligations, whereas neuropsychologists, we might have some more flexibility. Like, how do we be aware of that and be understanding of that there are certain aspects of the functioning of an of a academic health center or a VA where somebody would have less structure? What do we do and how do we differently accommodate those those different parts of this system that we are a part of, you know, um, for one, like, you know, we had staff members who um, very specifically from eight to 12 are testing. There's no, they are there, they are physically there for testing. Um, but we realized, you know, it was um, election day and people couldn't get out to vote. So we swapped in as faculty to make sure that they could go and vote on election day without having to take personal time. Um, those are things that are really important and it's not rocket science, but like how do we accommodate people being people in ways that make sense until we can finally get uh, election day as a national holiday, which I'm holding out for. But um, things like that where we can really be aware um, in small and big ways and realize that you know, as a graduate student, you're not at the top of that pyramid. You're not gonna have the same power to advocate for yourself but really note kind of the things that made your life harder because you are very quickly gonna be in a position where you can maybe affect a little bit of change or a lot of change. Also be thinking about participating in your um, governance opportunities at the national level because you getting that committee experience kind of stretch muscles, kind of getting involved and known gives you a platform, an opportunity to use that committee experience towards something that may be really meaningful to you. Um, I think the business of neuropsychology is also something we don't, 
teach well or manage well, but it's very related to self-care and work-life balance. If you don't know your business, you can't advocate for flexibility in it. You can't get attention for it. So being able to kind of um, know your business, be involved so that when those opportunities come to advocate for Medicare, Medicaid kind of standards, RBUs, payouts, things like that, that the business is strongly, I mean, there's a power element to your ability to advocate for self-care and work-life integration. Um, knowing the business of it and being involved at that level is another way among many, many ways that you can influence in a way that will perpetuate for generations forward kind of how, um, how we act as clinicians and, and as professionals. So I think um, having kind of having your eyes open and really thinking about there's room, there's space for everybody to be more involved in this advocacy. Uh, we just need to give people some more on-ramps to figure out where they fit. And I just want to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you go for it, go for it. It's all good. Bounce it back off each other. But I just yeah. wanted to add to that too, that you touched on something that's really important, which is a lot of what you're describing also describe, uh, also um, kind of defines needing self-awareness and monitoring of boundaries and practicing self-compassion. And these are not things that we're really taught to do very well, even at the graduate school level. Um, and, uh, and when you carry this then out into your profession, no matter where you are in your profession, you kind of are stuck in your ways. And it's really hard, I think, as an early career neuropsychologist or at the training level to practice that, even if you have that self-awareness, how do you then exercise those boundaries and advocate for yourself if there's something that you need? And then how do you practice that self compassion and, and that plays into your self-esteem, your um, individual and cultural differences, um, uh, lots of different uh, kind of personal characteristics, environmental characteristics and things about um, you know, just normalizing that we stick our foot in our mouth or we, you know, we have those bumps in the road, but that's where having really strong mentorship can be so helpful in navigating these, whether that's in your current environment, or if you seek mentorship outside from one of these different organizations that has mentorship available, um, those can be super helpful in terms of how do you navigate, um, you know, when you have that flexing work-life integration piece or needing to focus a little bit more on wellness or not knowing how to advocate for yourself or having questions about what's normal or not, or wanting to tear your hair out, whatever it is, having that mentorship can be so helpful. Yeah, I think um, I didn't have any um, female mentors coming up, but I know that some of my colleagues are having more of that experience. And I, I got some of my mentorship as far as some of my life choices from the fellows that I worked underneath, the fellows that I worked beside. Um, and, and that was really important to me. And I, I still tell them, you know, to this day, you know, that was important to me. I almost didn't realize how important because when I got to that point in my life, I was like, oh, I've seen somebody do this before and do it well. Like, um, I think that that's a gift. So finding people kind of access to, to mentors and stuff. Because when you're coming up, you don't know what, you don't know what normal is. You don't know. And the thing is, is normal varies quite a bit. I think as a student, I would definitely ask, a, not every place you go is going to have great boundaries. And unfortunately, you might find yourself in a position where you have to try and like, deal with a suboptimal situation. But when you go on interviews, really talk to those existing students and how they spend their time. A lot of times they'll make the students available to you to talk to that are not part of the evaluative process. So be clear about whether or not you're meeting with a student who's also evaluating you or one that's just here to kind of give you information. Um, but really use your, use your spidey sense and your, your clinical sense of like, you know, what's happening here? Because that environment is gonna tell you a lot about what's expected. Um, and if you have a choice, you are going to feel more satisfied with your work and with your life if you are make, selecting positions that are consistent with your values um, and consistent with what you believe. And that's easier said than done because a lot of us are in such strong competition with each other for so long that it's hard to break out of that mindset. You always feel like you're reaching, you always feel like you're just barely you know, getting there. Having the courage to make a decision that isn't kind of just the very tippy top is some kind of can be hard, but they don't have to be either or. You can work in a place and be incredibly successful and be like a balanced human being. Those are not mutually exclusive. I think one thing, just to chime in, um, and maybe since we're about halfway through, I just want to transition, make sure we, mm -hmm. you know, get to lots of our topics. This is wonderful though. Um, 
I hope I'm assuming our attendees are feeling the same way. Um, so as somebody who was a practicum student under Dr. Laura Grandy, I think one thing that she said to me that really stuck is that you can kind of have it all, but not always all at the same time, you know, which mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. So I think like realizing that that's a, that that should be a normalized experience might be helpful, right? Of like shifting around this kind of like the message I'm hearing to sort of summarize what you're saying of the integration. Um, yeah, I would, I would say that seasons of life definitely apply. You know, there's a season of life where you're doing your dissertation where you yeah. might have the best balance you've ever had in your life. The key of yeah. that a season, not a life sentence. So may be able to make the distinction between them and realize that you will have seasons. Life, is, if you're lucky, life is long. So mm -hmm. don't lose sight of the long game. Don't lose the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. If you're unlucky, then life is short and you're not going to regret spending that more, more time. At, I should have been at work more. You're not going to be thinking that. So really the incentive is to think about the big picture and, and, and well-being the whole way through. Yeah. And how can we do that in a way where we're, we're kind of, you will study things and you will write papers on things that you haven't conceived of as being part of your career as a graduate student. Your, your career will take lots and lots of paths in a way that you can't predict. So flexibility will serve you all along the way. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, there's a question. I'm going to kind of blend these together a little bit. Um, it's, there's a couple of questions. There's a few questions in the Q&A, which I think would be um, particularly important to talk about, I think, given um, your discussion of how, you know, in the ethics code that we are ethically obligated as psychologists or psychologists in training to take care of ourselves um, in order to provide, you know, the best standard of care we can to patients. Um, so blending these questions together that came in, um, I guess, can you speak to kind of, I feel like uh, ironically and horrifically our field, um, neuropsychology and psychology in general does not get a good reputation for um, how we respond to people who themselves have mental health problems, um, because, you know, I think there's data, I don't know if from psychology, but there's data I know from medical school, I think like at any given time, a quarter of medical students are actively experiencing some mental health, um, problem at that moment, but I feel like our field's not very good at it. So I'm, I'm kind of curious how we can be better about, um, within the context of, you know, self-care, which includes many things like we've talked about, like family care, just, just having time for yourself because that's a value of yours. How can we uh, be better about mental health? And also how um, the question, the, one of the questions too is about um, experiencing negative discrimination as biases of, as a woman in neuropsychology. So I'm curious if um, you can speak to that as well and kind of how we, how as a field can we advocate to dismantle these practices of sort of discriminating against people for things that are not in their control, obviously. I think that's a really, those are, those are two excellent questions and very, very loaded. Um, I'm going to start off with um, the negative biases and discrimination as a woman in the field. Um, I can speak from my own experience. And when I was on internship, at the very end of my internship, I found out that I was pregnant and I was terrified to tell my internship. Uh, and that, and the reason I needed to tell them at that time was because I was having just, you know, lots of all the morning sickness and I felt awful and I couldn't, it was like, I felt like I was like on the floor and it was so hard just to peel me off from like the pure exhaustion in those, that first trimester. Um, and I didn't really feel a lot of support at that time. And where I was in my career at that time, I didn't also have people to talk to about normalizing this experience or advocating for myself. And when I went to my fellowship at that point, I needed to tell them because I was going to be needing to take some time off um, during my first year. And I was so scared to say anything. And I went in and I said, I'm just going to take my two weeks of sick leave. I won't be gone any more than that. And I pretty much horrified my training director and my supervisors. And that was the first time where I had any, I felt like I had more support in where I was as a young woman, as, you know, having a family and this time where I should really be excited, um, feeling this, you know, incredible push pull in between, you know, that personal side of me and then also advancing my professional side. And um, when I was kind of going through the process of then going towards my career, my training director gave me the best advice, which I now tell everybody, regardless of you know where they are, who they are, anything. But if you you know don't feel like sharing parts of yourself when you're on your interviews, things that are really salient to you, uh, because you're afraid that they're going to judge you negatively, is that somewhere that you really want to spend your time building your career? And that's something that only you can answer. But it was such um, salient and pertinent advice to me. 
that being said, I still felt a lot of pressure. I didn't feel like I could, you know, I kind of had to sneak away to pump and all that other stuff. Um, and this really didn't even come to light to me until a few years later into my career. And we had um, somebody who was on internship um, who had just had a baby and our program did a beautiful job of setting up clear boundaries for her to be able to take that time to pump and then have, you know, be able to see her patients and do all of that other stuff. And I was already into my career and I went, oh my, where was this when I was a trainee? Um, and I think that that just really um, impacted me. And I think a lot of it, just also, again, speaking from a personal perspective, was the pressures that I was putting on myself about how much do I share or say uh, about my personal life and having a family because I was afraid that I wasn't going to get the same opportunities offered to me because people might make certain assumptions about where my priorities were and then feeling the need to, um, to compensate for that. I think women in medicine, women in academia, um, we have different pressures that are placed upon us um, in terms of, you know, how we publish, how we also manage our personal lives and our families. Um, and, uh, you know, when they, when you look at the literature against women and men in academia, you know, there's clear discrepancies in that. Um, so I could kind of go on and on about this, but it's something that I'm very open about talking about with my trainees, uh, because I think it's something that does need to break down the stigma about how we balance things that are personal and professional. And we have had, I've had trainees who are men who have had, their wives have had babies or children, and they're trying to balance this. And it's, it's different for them in and of itself because of the roles that they have within their family. And then the roles that they have as a trainee as well. And so trying to also make that, um, normalize that, that they're also sleep deprived if there's a new baby in the house. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that are affecting them in terms of their relationship and the interpersonal um, characteristics. If their partner is not necessarily the person that's here in our training environment, um, it's still impacting them and deserves to have a conversation and be part of it as well. Yeah, I would just add to that, that um, you're not always going to have, I hope that people have learned their lesson and they're doing better. You might be in a situation where even somebody that you um, had looked up to or you know, thought highly of responds poorly to a request that you have to make to advocate for yourself. Um, know that you can seek mentorship in lots of different ways. You can have a mentor um, for research, for clinical work, for personal stuff. You can kind of draw broadly. Um, I can say for myself, I, I got some of the most most of the ugliness from um, from women who were a generation above me. I think the context of what they came into the academic medicine specifically was very rough, and um, not all the it wasn't a pleasant experience, and it was difficult and required me to go to HR. And there was like a there was a whole thing. So you might find yourself in a situation where you have to level up um, and advocate for yourself, and you might feel disappointment at times, but know that you can. You don't have to reach out just to the person most proximal to you. Um, I've mentored um, individuals in kind of a more personal professional development capacity that are no longer part of my institution or, or elsewhere. And that's great too, because not all of us have the incredible luck of having an amazing mentor who aligns with us in our identity or in our, in our lifestyle. But really what I would ask you is to think broadly about, you know, in this kind of virtual world that we live in, don't hesitate to reach out and ask for some of that mentorship. And I know some groups like um, the uh, Asian Neuropsychology Group, um, I know that they're hooking up mentors across states and, you know, across countries because there's such a, a lack of appropriate mentorship on some of these important topics. So really think broadly about it and know that if you don't have a positive interaction, you there are lots of other people who've had that experience that you can talk to about that and what your options are. Yeah, I think that's a, a kind of the size with one other question that's um, on a similar topic, I think, which is, I think, kind of the, the million dollar question in many ways. Um, so this question is, how do you say no to supervisor or I guess request, how do you say no to requests in general when they're not really in your scope of your training or your goals um, mm -hmm. while maintaining a good relationship? I feel like 
you just spoke Dr. Moxley to this point where sometimes you don't. And maybe that's kind of like, if you will, like an exposure for ourselves of there are sometimes negative outcomes and positive ones, but how do you, how do you both approach saying no or training your mentees to say no? It's tough because I've had supervisors who said, um, don't say yes to something you can't deliver on. And I internalized that. And then I went to another place and they said, don't say no to anybody. Like you're not allowed to say no to that person because it's bad politics for us. And so the, the challenge there was me learning, okay, I have two people in leadership who are in control of my well-being in life. They're giving me contradictory information. So just know that that might happen. Um, one of the things that I can do for my position as being faculty is I have a little bit more room to negotiate and say, these are the things that you have, you have decided there are priorities for me to complete in my capacity to do this job that you have told me to do. These are the things that I'm doing. For me to take on this part, I need to eliminate something from these priorities. Which of these would you like me to eliminate? So that way you're making it clear about how much work that you're doing for that person and where their priorities are and this other thing and how it might conflict with those priorities. So not, you're not taking on responsibility for making sure that all of their wish list appears magically. You're kind of reinforcing the amount of valued work that you're doing on the front end of that and that it's not an infinite resource but please tell me how would you like to, should we realign some of those priorities? Because you can't have everything all the time. So finding a, a way to kind of softly have that discussion has been something that's worked for me. I think it also depends on where you are. If you're you know, in your training and you're responding to a supervisor and you're in training versus you're in your career and you're a professional and responding to your supervisor asking something of you um, because your supervisor has different types of evaluative roles in each of those situations. And so uh, I think it's really important that we um, help our trainees to understand those boundaries and exercise being able to say no to something, but how you do it is really important. So for example, you know, if a trainee, uh, if, a, if a supervisor asks you to do something and it's clearly outside of the, the amount of time that you have set aside for a particular activity or whatever that may be, um, and, or maybe it's just not in line with your goals and values and everything that you've kind of set up in your program, um, if you don't feel comfortable talking about that, or, or maybe you do, either way, you know, talking to the per person who's the program lead or the training director can be a great way to kind of bounce ideas off that first to see if they think that this might be something that could be helpful or a good way to maybe approach the topic if you don't feel comfortable to approach the supervisor. Or if you do feel like you've got a good relationship with your supervisor, you could sit down and say, you know, these are my goals and my priorities. I'm really interested in this, but I don't think that, kind of back to Dr. Boxley's point is, I don't think that I would have the time to devote to really do a good job in that these are the things that I have going on right now. And it really is a delicate balance because sometimes your supervisors may see something that is a great opportunity or something and make that offer to you. And one, they might not know what your other competing demands are, mm -hmm. which make it challenging for them to really have a good appreciation of what your, your time demands are. Um, or two, they may know what those uh, other obligations are and think, you know what, I think you're really capable of being able to do this. And it might be more of a negotiation as to what this looks like. So, um, you know, being flexible, I think can be really helpful. And then how you approach that conversation is extremely important. And then if you're not sure how to approach it, seeking mentorship from either a training director or a neuropsychology lead or somebody outside who's also serves in that mentorship role or even in peers. I would agree with that in saying that many programs will have definitely like six month, if not kind of quarterly meetings where you talk about, these are my goals for the next three months. This is what they look like. This is what we achieve. This is what's lingering. And then when you have that discussion, you can say like, you can kind of lay out, you know, this is my goal for the next three months. Do we need to deprioritize some of this stuff to facilitate this other stuff that might be in my best interest as I'm looking towards fellowship applications or I'm looking towards being on the job market? Those things you could, if you're having kind of regular meetings, that's a natural place for you guys to have that discussion about like, how should, these are all the things on our table, but we want to rearrange how they occur, the timeline in which they occur. So maybe it's not a, a flat no, but it's a, let's stretch the timeline on this in this way. But also realize that your supervisors have terrible working memory they sometimes have terrible short-term memory. And so a lot of times, um, because they're juggling a lot of things, they're not as in the loop as they should be about exactly what's happening. So a lot of times, I really personally appreciate when students 
advocate for themselves and tell me, okay, these are what my needs are coming up. I, I love that reorientation to the goals because it helps me be a better supervisor. It keeps me on track. So we're mutually making sure that when you get through with this experience that you got the things that we planned for and that you feel confident kind of leaving this experience, whether it's practicum, internship, fellowship, um, about what you're getting as you go on to the next level. And I also just want to say, I think sometimes the ask or the reason why you want to say no can be a useful discussion in and of itself, because maybe you want to say no to something because you're intimidated or you feel you don't have the self-confidence or um, you feel like it's outside your wheelhouse or whatever it may be. And it may be that having a conversation with you know other people or your supervisor or whatnot can be a helpful way to explore that. And maybe it's something that you do have the time for and, and you're interested in doing, but you just need the right amount of support in order to do it. So either way, kind of thinking about what the question is and why your answer is what it is can be helpful. Yeah, I definitely think that comes, that's a really good point. There's like, I can think of an example, like a paper that I got best rejected several times. I really didn't want to touch ever again. And my mentor kept pushing me and it was me saying no out of, you know, sadness. <laughs> um, in terms of, I just wanted to ask, or just like a practical note too. I, I saw Katie or Dr. Block's uh, chat here saying as a supervisor, she confirms working memory is poor. From a practical <laughs> suggestion, do you, I, one thing I've noticed, I mean, it's been helpful for me at least, do you like, or do you recommend sending like emails after meetings, to, like summarize what you've done or have like written like records, I'm guessing of things as kind of a confirmation for people, is that helpful? I think it's like, if it is something that you'll stick with, if it's something that speaks to you as a trainee, I tend to be pretty flexible about that kind of stuff. I It, it shows me that you're thinking about it. And even if your thinking evolves, that you're, you're kind of keeping track of that time. I like that initiative personally. I think it's a good idea. Um, and I, I do think that, um, you know, I do, your education is a collaborative experience. So anything that you do that facilitates that collaboration, I think is a good thing. I think that it depends on what it is too. So if you're in your workplace, for example, and you need some CYA um, for conversations that may be a little bit more challenging, um, uh, you know, summarizing that and just sending it can also be a nice way to say, hey, you know, this was my kind of takeaway from our meeting. Um, just to make sure that we're on the same page. It also gives you kind of a written documentation of it. Um, as a supervisor, I love it and I welcome it when my trainees send me reminders for things that I haven't responded to or reports that I have outstanding for that reason. But if it's not front and center in my mind and on my screen, um, I will probably forget it. And so I, I welcome it and I let them know that. Yeah. Um, so we're about 10 minutes until the top of the hour. Um, so we'll just transition kind of more to the remaining general Q&A. So if anyone has any questions for Dr. Boxley or Dr. Dean, um, I encourage you to submit them now. Um, one question we got, I think is a little bit along um, the practical line with like RVUs that you mentioned, Dr. Boxley. Mm -hmm. The question reads, um, how do you suggest we gather more information about the business or revenue related data within our specific systems in which we work or train? I suspect there might be several opportunities like buying out time that we're not aware of that can help lower caseloads and aid in this work-life integration. So I'm, I'm curious what you all think. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important question. So um, I think, especially in generations past, they were less in the weeds about the business because they didn't have to be, kind of the dynamics were different. But now in this marketplace, we're seeing more groups having to be really responsible for you know, what's happening there. So just know that there's multiple different ways to measure productivity. You can do RVU, which is assigned a value kind of at a national level, but RVU changes. So recently there was an update where therapy improved and in, uh, increased in RVU per hour, but assessment didn't, which put us at a strategic disadvantage where we would have to work more total hours as neuropsychologists than therapists would to reach the same level. So there's some issues there and we're, we're working on advocacy on that um, that's needed. Another way that an academic medical center might approach it is they might say, uh, we want, you know, nine, if you're hundred percent clinical, we want my 90% billable hours in some way. That might be one way to do it. Um, another way to do it um, could be kind of buying out of time. So you might say, you know, other departments are often very interested in our services. Um, you know, but we're not going to be on call per se, but you might say, I might get 20% or 0.2, which is a Monday or something where I go sit over in neurology and run a service there. And so they just cover that portion of salary, which kind of changes the calculus across the board. You can also talk to your chairs about, you know, I see you, you really value this role in, um, 
in education for me to do education, this is what I would propose. This would kind of pull from us to make that, um, to reach that kind of uh, benchmark that you have. How do we kind of negotiate some time for that to work or not? And if it doesn't kind of what other accommodations might be flexible. Um, but I do think that the RVU method has some concerns with it. It's, it's um, some other places do hours worked. So it's so everybody, regardless of what the RVU value is, is working the same amount of hours and the RVU is what it is that's something they do on the back end. Um, I know some folks in Chicago do revenue. So how much is actually collected is what drives how many patients are seen. So I don't know, every state and frankly, every region is gonna have something that potentially works differently for them because insurance plays out different across um, insurance products across states. Like there's a lot of sophistication, which means that it doesn't generalize like this solution is gonna work in Oregon, it probably wouldn't. So that's where being involved at your state level is gonna be important. The, the advantage of working in some government settings is they might have kind of more concrete expectations. I don't know what, what the VA is doing, but um, right now between um, kind of academic medicine, kind of kind of other forms of kind of hospital-based work, it is kind of the wild west as far as how much breadth there is and what they're demanding. Yeah, and the only other comment I have to that, because so the, the VAs are very, very different. Um, the, there's a saying that once you've been to one VA, you've been to one VA. And some VAs are looking more at RVUs and productivity, whereas others are not. Um, having been in an academic medical center prior to this, they use things like the ACGME uh, standards, which is clearly disadvantage. There's a huge disadvantage for neuropsychologists and how we build. And in so many ways, it's, it, you know, I'm, <laughs> it's not super useful because the more efficient you are, the, um, the less reward you have essentially towards that. It's kind of a negative reinforcement because more efficient you are with your practice, the more you have to do to cover that the same mm -hmm. as, you know, the next person who may take longer to write reports and, do longer interviews and, and things like that. So really interesting question. I know Mark Barisa has, has written quite a bit on the practice of neuropsychology and has um, talked about different things related to um, work, work revenue and things like that, if you haven't seen his, um, his book. I would say state organizations are also kind of where it's at because things are really so fast. Like we are best buds with our billing specialist and like that part of that is just experience and exposure. So, um, Kind of, and, and there will be politics inherent in that. When you get into somebody's books, tread carefully because you could get differing kind of responsiveness as far as how willing they are to let you in on that. Um, so that might be something where you have to kind of be strategic and cautious about. That's good to know. Um, so we don't have any more questions in the Q&A box. So maybe um, in the last couple of minutes, I don't know if you have any concluding thoughts. You've shared a lot of information, which I think is incredibly valuable for hopefully everyone across different training and career stages, but I'm curious if you have any summary thoughts that you'd like to leave us with. Yeah, I mean, I think this is um, something that we've kind of touched on already, which is we really need to outline what work-life integration, what wellness, what burnout, what these things look like in neuropsychology and talk about the critical role of training programs and how we can identify wellness at different levels of training and different levels of our career. And these are things that include the role of the professional organizations in advocating for systemic change, recognizing differences in demands and equities, inequities at various phases of our professional journey, implications for the setting and organizational leadership, the impacts of EDI, um, the role of so, uh, the sociopolitical influence on well-being. We didn't really talk about that one today, but the role that that plays on well-being and our overall feeling of safety, uh, the importance of advancing advocacy at the institutional level and place of employment. Um, I think that's the, that's kind of hopefully what's going to be coming out in our paper uh, as we're proposing what this looks like for neuropsychology and how we can start really proposing change. Um, and you know how we can, this is so systemic and so ingrained and it's going to take a lot of different angles for us to come out to really start promoting um, the normalization of it uh, and then how to implement changes within our, our various levels that we have personally and professionally. Yeah, I would just say that I would encourage people to really think about and assess where is your privilege? Everybody's got some level of a where is it and where do you wanna spend it? 
you don't get to keep it when you leave. So where are you gonna spend your privilege in a way that's gonna benefit people coming behind you? Um, I would also say, use your vacation. Tell people about your vacation, use your sick days. Don't gripe at people for using their sick days. Uh, hopefully everybody you work with is more interesting than just their job. So make room for people to be more than their job. Um, there are very few neuropsych emergencies, so we can afford time to recognize mutual humanity. And in doing that, you're going to be more accessible and more perceptive as a clinician. You're going to be happier with your work in your home life. And you're going to protect your family and friends from the instability and insecurity of a deranged psychologist who doesn't make a good partner, a good parent, or a good friend. Um, so really thinking about living our values and uh, you know, not prescribing things and talking about them in an abstract way, but then not living them because your students, students watch us, you know, we have an obligation to, we say we have boundaries, prove it. Show me a good boundary. Show me that you're living your life. Show me that you understand that people are, are bigger than the jobs and, and go find out about the people who you work with and understand that um, we're not just kind of cogs in a machine. And, and there doesn't have to be an opposition between working hard and being a human being. That, I think that tension of competition is kind of a vestige of the past. You can be successful and a real person. We just have to, and men, please do, men need to engage in some of these things that have been feminized. We need to, everybody needs to participate in things. Um, guys need to be taking their paternity leave. They need to be taking their sick leave. They need to be talking about their vacations too. Everybody needs to be acting out the thing that we say that we value, especially as mental health providers. I think those are phenomenal summary points. Um, I really want to thank you, Dr. Dean and Dr. Boxley, for joining us for No Neuropsychology today um, to talk about these issues. Because I think they're, we're, I, I'm so pleased that we could prominently feature them because I think they are sidelined and we all need to kind of take up the gamut of advocacy wherever we live. I know we have lots of international audience as well. So I think that's an issue across the board for all of us. Um, just one comment for next week for anyone who's joining us. Um, we're rounding the end of volume four, which is pretty wild to think about that we've done almost 48 lectures with phenomenal people like yourselves. Um, so next week we have Dr. Robin Howarth, who's talking about um, pediatric patients with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. So that's at 11 o'clock Eastern time on November 29th. Um, I hope everybody has a good week. And thank you again, Dr. Boxley and Dr. Dean, for joining us. It's so it a pleasure to chat with you today. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Thank Thanks you. for having me.